thank you for joining us again with the Family Ties Podcast. My name is Julia Avery, and this is my sister and co-host, Kelly Ritchie. Hi, guys. It's me again. How's it going? We're, we're glad to be back with you again. Before we really dive in, I would like to um, ask you guys if you would please, if you are watching on the YouTube platform, please go below, hit subscribe. But if you are listening on a podcasting platform, um, please rate and review and also subscribe there as well. But um, all those things really help us out and your comments, especially when constructive, do help a lot as well. So we thank you guys for that and we thank you for watching and listening. And Julia, what are we going to be getting into today? So today we're covering a still open case uh, about Orson and Orrin West. I think there's a four-year-old and a three-year-old that went missing on December 21st in California. They were adopted children. Um, and they, the story that the parents came up with just doesn't line up. It's very interesting. There's still a lot of loose ends. The police don't have a bunch of things resolved. So it's a very interesting case. I think we should, you know, definitely cover this right now. Um, We've got some interesting details that we can share, but other than that, this is still an open case. But So this will be a lot of conjecture on yeah. our part and a lot of questions on our part that we yes. we hope to see some answers to shortly, but um, just bear with us. We're going off of what the most recent news and updates have been, and of course, this is liable to change any at any point in time, and we will check back in with this and make sure we keep you guys posted, but yeah. As of right now, there are there are more theories than there are facts. So the facts that we do have to present aren't very many. <clears throat> and there's still some of them are questionable because they deal with statements from certain people that are still not zeroed out as far as suspects go. Yeah. So, so at this point in time, the boys are still missing and they have not been discovered alive or deceased. Uh, the details coming out are clearly just not making this case any easier to unwind. But one thing is certain, the parents um, are remaining kind of firmly at the center of this um, this very public disappearance. The adoptive mother and father have claimed, to re um, claimed recently that they've been receiving death threats and harassment from the public. They've had to um, move out of that house. Um, <clears throat> they're staying with someone else, I think some other family members right now. The there is four a, children that they do have are in protective custody, correct? Yes. Yes. So they're not because with the there parents. have been people that have been breaking into the home. In the backyard. Where, yeah. yeah. That one breaking guy. Breaking into windows and, and uh, you it's know, just crashing. It's nuts. Place. What's yeah. happening? What's what's going on? Because it's until, like. Ugh. Until we have evidence, we shouldn't be. And first of all, that's not how you handle that in the first place. <laughs> you know, even no. if they are guilty, that's not how you go about it. Um, but it, they're, they're still children involved and family involved. And we don't know that they're guilty yet. We suspect, but we don't know. So don't, they could be totally blameless and people are putting, making this grieving process even harder for them. But again, there's so much we don't know, but still just be respectful and let the, you know, Yes. investigators do their jobs. No matter what we firmly think, Julie and I are not condoning in any way, shape or form people no. who think that they can take the law into their own hands and no. do their own form of vigilante justice. I think, thank you, Marvel, for creating a culture that thinks that it's OK to take the law into your own hands just because you know what's good for the public. <clears throat> So, um, more importantly, who are Oren and Orson West? Uh, the West brothers are, of course, the adopted sons of Trezell and Jacqueline West. So, Oren is the four-year-old and Orson is the three-year-old. And the couples say they began fostering Oren and Orson in 2018 and then officially completed the adoption process in 2019. They also have four other children, two of whom are adopted and two that are biological Um and those kids are the ones that were taken into protective custody after Oren and Orson went missing. Um, and both boys are about three feet tall and weigh around 40 pounds. They were last seen wearing black sweaters and dark colored sweatpants. Um, Julie, you've created a nice timeline for us here. Do you want to start us off? 
Well, before I go into anything, <clears throat> if no one listens any further than this, if um, they are saying if you have any information at all regarding this case, uh, that you are to call the California City Police Department at 760-373-8606. To remain anonymous, you can call the secret witness line at 661-322-4040. Nice. I had put that towards the end. So I like that, Julie. I like that you're starting out with that. Yes. If you guys know anything, have seen anything, no matter how small or insignificant, please do share that. Um, it looks like the the officers, um, especially what's the lead detective's name uh, of the law enforcement team here? Chief uh, John Walker. Walker. Um, he is being really good and transparent about what's going on and what he needs from the public. And it seems like there's been a great public over an overwhelming public response. He um, received over 2,500 tips <clears throat> that they've look, looked all into. And he's, he's saying, you know, no matter how small the tip, you know, they will do their best to look into it. And I think, I think that's great. So yeah, I think it's in good hands, honestly, until we know more. Yeah. So um, I did a background check on Travel Trizel. Is it Trizel? Trizel, yes. Trizel and Jacqueline West. Um, they have very clean records, and I expected that because they were able to, you know, get the adoption process complete with Orson and Orin. So and the two other have, kids, and the two other kids. Mm-hmm. I I don't know their names, but I think they've got them left out for privacy sake. Um, yes. Do you know um, how old the couple is? Because I, that's one thing that I didn't 30s. see. 34 and, and 32, I think. They look very young to have yes. six. I mean, not just like even if it was biological. It's just like six kids. Why? Um, and is it for the money? Is it for, you know, the the check that they get for fostering and taking care of? Like, I just am Do they get a really check for, for finalizing adoption? How does that work? <clears throat> yeah, I just want to know because uh, – I'm really curious. I know with fostering, you can get a check, but when you finalize an adoption, do you still receive funding? That's a good question. While you go into this timeline, I'm going to actually look that up. See. All right. So everything kind of started on Monday, December 21st. Um, It was early in the evening. It said Orson and Oren play outside as their adoptive father gathers firewood, according to their parents, adoptive parents. The father, Trezell West, later tells the media he briefly went back inside the house and when he came out, the boys were gone. He says he drove through nearby streets and spoke with neighbors but couldn't find them. <clears throat> Again on Monday around 6 p.m., the boys' adoptive parents report them missing. Around 8 p.m., two hours later, the California City Police send out a news release that provides a description of the boys, but not their names or photographs. That information re- is released hours later. Uh, Monday night, volunteers and police search areas near where the boys went missing. Police bring canines to the home. The dogs find the boys sent inside the house, but not outdoors. Were you about to say something, Kelly? Kelly? Yeah, it's on this this end of it. It's um, I found something that said, what did the police find at the scene? It actually raised a question for me. Um, <clears throat> they're saying that the police canines caught the boys sent inside the house, but not outside. So right. to me, right off the bat there, does that indicate that the only reason they caught the scent inside is because the boys had belongings there, like clothes, toys right. that had their scent on it. Right. And then they their story is a lie because they would never were in the backyard. Well, let's finish the timeline and then go over our theories and questions just so everything kind of flows. Yeah. So so that's where that ended on Monday and then Tuesday. um, And I got this from um, KGET um, local news for California. So we'll have a link in our summary to where all of this information has come. They have, um, the, the timeline and breakdown. And it was, it was great. I really liked it. So, um, on Tuesday around 9 AM with daylight volunteers continue the search and spread through the surrounding area. They find nothing on Tuesday afternoon. Police take the adoptive parents in for further questioning on Tuesday night, 
Armed with a search warrant, investigators go through the home and leave with evidence collected in several brown bags in a duffel bag. The adoptive parent's van is towed to be searched. Police tell 17 News the FBI is involved and agents question the adoptive parents. Police say the, po- the parents are cooperating. So then it moves on to Wednesday afternoon. Um, the adoptive parents speak with the media. Trizel and Jacqueline West say they were told by police Monday to stay in their home during the search. Trizel West explains how the boys went missing and the couple say they fostered the boys in 2018, then adopted them in 2019. They say they have two other adopted children and two biological children, all of whom have been removed from the home since the investigation began. The couple say their cell phones and other technological devices were seized by police. Again, on Wednesday afternoon, the police searched the home again. Um, on the boys' adoptive parents, Trizel and Jacqueline West discuss the case with the media, and investigators work under bright lights set up in the family's backyard. It's unclear what, if any, evidence was found. So then on December 29th, California City Police Chief John Walker tells the media foul play is suspected, and nothing was found when investigators dug up the West family backyard. On January 2nd, the extended family of the missing boys issue a statement expressing their hopes for the boys' safe return, that they are cooperating with authorities, and have involved a team of private investigators. The statement said family members have been advised to avoid the public because of the intensity and amount of threats they have received. The West Home in California has been targeted by rocks and attempted break-ins, according to the statement. And <clears throat> to play off of that... Um, I did see that um, they said it uh, that it's, um, you know, since there are no suspects yet, it's misguided to blame uncles and aunts and grandparents for children who are missing that um, we love and care about and are trying to find. Um, Absolutely. This, the grandma said in a recent public statement, um, she said that people need to not rush to conclusions that they're grieving. But to me, that also sounds odd, seeing as the boys might still be alive if they were, in fact, taken. But it's still, I mean, not really, because, I mean, you can still grieve without the finality of death. Mm -hmm. You can grieve the loss and missing of your children. I mean, there's grieving to be had. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, to me, that doesn't sound strange from her. There were some statements from... Giselle, we'll get into later that mm. I was like, mm. Mm. But the grandma, the, what the grandma's saying, it's like, yeah, don't, don't point fingers without evidence. You know, they have to grieve too. Right. Um, on the fourth businesses got together and offered a total of $25,000 to anyone who could find the boys on the 21st of January, the reward money rose to $100,000 for anyone with information leading to the boys' whereabouts. The money has been donated by businesses, churches, the adoptive family, and the city. I think the adoptive family, um, that one of the 30, uncles, right? 30,000. 30, yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> So January 25th, the California City Police Department is asking for residents to report anyone seen trespassing at the home of missing Orrin and Orson West's adoptive parents. A candlelit vigil was held outside the boys' home Monday evening with those participating praying for their safe return. On February 1st, the police and federal agents revisited the home of the Orson's boys, Orson Boy's adoptive parents this Monday morning with special equipment that sends a signal into the ground to see if there's anything underneath. Nothing was found during the visit, according to police. And that was probably due to that theory that they were buried in the backyard. Mm -hmm. I don't think they Um, are buried in the, at that house. I don't think they could be at the Bakersfield residence, but yeah, I don't think somewhere else entirely. Yeah. I don't think it happened here. No. Um, So there was another candlelit prayer. It was held outside of the Bakersfield home where the boys lived before they were adopted. That was on February 2nd. And then on the 6th, the family issued their statement about being targeted by the public. So now into theories. Well, and then to kind of uh, go back a little bit, um, it's very interesting because before we go into any of the videos and things, it says that, you know, basically the story that the two of them are telling is is very well backed up by like evidence that 
is being found or, or, you know, like the, the events, the chain of events and the times. But that does not mean that they did not have anything to do with this. And the reason I say that is because <clears throat> um, so they, their theory, Jacqueline and Trezell have said that the boys vanished from the backyard, possibly roaming into the California desert. Well, first of all, you know, it doesn't the dogs, you know, they've brought in lots of teams of dogs and there, there's no trace of the kids ever having been in the backyard, just the, the scent caught in the house. So like we talked about earlier, it could be um, them smelling, sniffing clothes. It doesn't necessarily mean that they were in the house relatively recently, just their belongings. Um, so, you know, clearly the biological mother is, you know, blaming the adoptive parents. She, she says that they did something. I feel like they did something and they know something. Um, and the West say they understand her anger. They, I think are, are trying to, put a front up that shows like that they, they understand everyone's questions and frustrations and the blame to them, but that doesn't necessarily absolve them of, of guilt. Right. You know, so they, the interview that they held for the public, um, I think it was two days after, um, after they went missing, their statement was very strange. Uh, Trizel did a lot of the talking. It was like a 13 minute interview. Um, there was an expert analysis done. Uh, we'll have links to that video as well. Someone on YouTube. Let's see. What was, let me get, what was her name again? That way we can credit her. Um, she did a good job. Yes, yeah, she did. Let's see here. And my statement. So. I'm going to have this cough the rest of my life, but Julia sent me a couple of really great videos and I watched the, the interview she's talking about with the two parents, the, um, the statement they made to the media. And one thing that struck me was just how he, the way he was crossing his hands over his chest and, you know, I know it's chilly, but it, it, it kind of seemed very hostile and defensive defensive like yeah protect yourself yeah but it also seems like their story is very practiced you know the way that when you practice something for a play or a musical and the person yeah. you're playing against is like um they're kind of mumbling your your lines just as they're, they're like following through with it they're very intently like you can see their mouths moving yeah you and and that impatience to like get to the next scene i can i can totally see that from the two of them and it seems very practiced for sure yes so a couple videos that were great were from um the youtube channel it's a crime um she she has several videos on um, both like the interview, uh, Chief Walker's statements and an expert analysis, um, like behavioral analysis on their interview, which kind of breaks down some of the statements and, and why things that they said were strange. You know, like they didn't mention the boys by their names. So it was very like disassociated. Um, I, it, and I know... I understand that everybody grieves differently and you can't, you know, assume how someone's going to definitely react in that kind of situation. But <clears throat> it seems strange the way they were, they were talking about things and the things that they kept emphasizing, like the gate, the gate, the gate, the dirt, um, something about wrapping presents brought that up a lot um chalk brought up chalk a lot and it was just like they were just trying to stick to their bullet points and <laughs> they would just keep going over those and over those but then um and when they were describing the boys as far as what they were like um it was like they were describing them as if they were troublesome rambunctious was the word they used instead of oh i love my boys i you know 
It wasn't like, oh, I can't be without them. I, you know, they've got to be so cold and scared right now. They were only describing how they were feeling, which showed a huge sign to me that there was like some sort of like lack of empathy involved. Or, or when they say something like rambunctious, it's almost like they're trying to pass blame yes. off onto the children. Right. For disappearing because they're bad ch- children, rambunctious or whatever. Right. It, like I'm a good better. parent. They're rambunctious and they w- ran away or they did this or they mm-hmm. they did this. This happened because they're rambunctious. Yeah. Not because I was neglecting them. <laughs> right. They kept saying things to kind of put themselves in a good light. And sure. Um, and I hate being the devil's advocate, but I'm just trying to like think from all the different areas since there are not a lot of facts or not a ton of evidence to go around. Um, but I can see how from their situation, they've got to be a little defensive. Say they are not guilty um, and everyone's blaming them. They know that they've got to issue this statement and they feel like under pressure. And so they end up saying all these things, trying to make themselves look better. But then at the same time, if you are an in-tune parent, you're very emotionally connected to the children and the loss of those, you're focusing on the child, what the child must be experiencing, and then just reiterating probably their best qualities and why you miss them. But it just seemed like they were all focused on themselves. Or... What I also saw, and here's the thing, let me preface this by saying I would look guilty as hell because I automatically in any situation, whether I did anything or not, we'll just, we don't have time to go back to my childhood to go through why that is, (laughs) but (laughs) I automatically feel guilty or, or almost as if people are going to look at me as if I've done something, even if I haven't. And in, in doing that, look guilty. Yes. So <laughs> I do the same for me. Thing. <laughs> it wouldn't matter what I said to the public in any way, shape, or form. It's going to be, it's going to not add up. People are going to be like, well, she said this, but then she's doing this. And look at her. She's not crying. But then I'm and like, some in my people head, say things strangely under pressure. For mm-hmm. instance, your girl Julia here, not the best with saying things. I can write like hell, but. You have me open my fucking mouth and it just doesn't happen correctly or the way I planned. And it's like, did she put any thought into this? I did. I overthought (laughs) it and I'm mixing all of the words together at the same time. I thought about it so much. I no longer remember what I was going to (laughs) say. But essentially, I think what does stick out is there. The fact that. They didn't seem, of course, to have any emotions. Of course, it it just seemed like they were going through a well-rehearsed story and they wanted to get it out as quickly as possible before they forgot details or missed something. And um, I think, you know, the fact that they're so corroborative of each other and their story is so, I don't know, it's it's very specific. They, They seem to have their story down. And another thing, I'm jumping away from that interview with them to bring up um, some stuff that I read about the security camera that the neighbor has. That was Um, what I was going to get to next. I have an interesting point to make after you go. Okay. So um, I found something that said that the, I think it was on ABC. Oh, yeah. It's Bakersfield Now. Dot com news. The California City Police Chief is now speaking on security camera footage from a neighbor from the day the boys went missing. Um, Police Chief Walker says that the security camera footage is consistent with the statements from Trezell and Jack Willen. But, okay, so here's where it gets interesting. The security camera footage shows on December 21st at 5.33 p.m., Trezell starts looking for the boys around the neighborhood. Now, I will go back in a second. So what it appears right here is that someone is uh, getting into a white van in front of the property and exiting, and it looks like he makes a left turn and goes eastbound on Aspen, um, says the police chief, John Walker. Now, he came back six minutes later. 
Fast forward to 5.53 when they got the call um, at 5.48, actually. And then they were on the scene within five minutes. So it looks like um, they their story is corroborated by like the phone call, the video, <clears throat> but here's where it's, it gets really interesting is, um, so Walker confirms that you can see what appears to be a dog on the other side of the fence in the footage, um, from December 21st, but from the angle of the camera, you cannot see the children in the backyard during any point of the footage. Eyewitness News also acquired security camera footage from two days before they went missing. <clears throat> so let's just kind of back up to when they went Christmas shopping. So um, the boys' adoptive parents claim they left their California City house on December 19th with their six children to go do Christmas shopping. So they've told the police, they're, we're, we're, we took our six kids um, and the security camera footage from the neighbor shows an adult holding the door open while four children got into the van. Then later that day, two adults, which appear to be Trezell and Jacqueline West, come back to the house without any kids. Um, so the parents claim that they left with all six kids. So here's where, you know, this is not adding up. Yeah. So my point that I'm curious about um, is the footage. Um, are they able to get this footage from like, uh, was it triggered by motion where it started recording or was this nonstop recording that they were able to rewind? Because Kevin was telling me about how the ring settings, you can put like a, a people focus setting where it'll only alert you when it recognizes a person um, and then it'll start recording and give you that alert. But um, the question is, would it do that if it captured a small person, like a toddler walking well, around? I mean, if Would it start recording then to show that they're walking out of from a backyard? Here's the thing is that I don't think it was one of those motion, motion capture things because you know, and it's facing the street. So some people may not have a ring. And in that neighborhood, it's not necessarily a well-off neighborhood. A lot of people do have, and around here, a lot of people have constantly running security footage of like the, the main entrance into their house. And it's just always going. So it really depends on what was used and what security footage right. that it was, you know. <clears throat> Yeah. So that was just a thought because I don't know. I don't know what kind of camera was used. I don't know the quite quite the angle. I was just curious about like its recording process. Is it nonstop or is well, it if it shows the the day that they went missing and it's like you can see their backyard from this person's camera, that would indicate to me that it's running all the time. Because, you know, it's not necessarily capturing someone at their front door. I mean, at the right. time frame that was being investigated, they seem to have the footage. So All right. it's, you know, my thought. Well, and it doesn't seem like any of the footage captured that's been made aware to the public so far has any evidence of the children ever being at that home, Orson and Orin. The four other kids, yes. Right. So, so it makes me wonder if these leads aren't popping up because maybe this happened somewhere else. Right. And so then does that part mean of me also that... wonders if they're if if like Trizel and Jacqueline are guilty. I'm mm -hmm. wondering if it was accidental and then they freaked out. And then they mm -hmm. had to stick to their guns because they're in too deep trying to cover but it up. It seems my, my current theory seems to be, or my current impression, not so much theory is that something happened to the boys before they moved to yes. the California city home. Yes. And so then that brings my other question up to be um, who other than the parents saw the uh, Orson and Orin last, like when was yeah. the last, Real sighting. Um, that way, I think that would help kind of 
reestablish a timeline Mm -hmm. and then narrow down like the the surrounding people uh, like the people involved during that time of the last sighting um because then you have new leads around that i mean there of course there aren't going to be any leads if it didn't happen here you know so have they you know of course i'm asking questions that we don't really know the answer to um has the the yard and the property around the bakersfield bakersfield residence been exhumed or not exhumed but like a that scan done on um to to check um but then again honestly i'm wondering if parents like that are going to necessarily want to bury the kids if something did happen accident or purposeful would they want to bury these kids on their property where people are most likely to look I right. think they're well. A why did they move in the that. first place? Touche. Um, I'm sure we'll we'll hear at some point, but I think um, I just want to know, like anybody in the neighborhood. I mean, because kids, how old are the other kids that we don't know the identities of? Um, and what do they how know? How old are they? <clears throat> exactly. And it seems like there are other people other than the parents that have been questioned and taken polygraph tests. Um, So I'm wondering, you know, everything could be really tightly under wraps right now because of the fact that they're still under investigation and they're getting all their ducks in a row. But I mean, they took the the couple's technology and they, they were searching through that. So who knows? I just think, you know, why were they lying? Because it's clearly a lie about taking the six kids so why would you claim to have taken all six kids shopping? And then they dropped the four kids. They only dropped the four. So in in what they're trying to sell us, they took all six kids on, on the 19th and they dropped four of them off at a, a friend's place so that they could go Christmas shopping. Now, who takes two toddlers Christmas shopping instead of older kids who are easier to, to handle? And then... They showed back up at home with none of the kids. So where did the two toddlers get left? Right. So, And then if they got left, then when did they ever get back to the house to then disappear? Right. So <clears throat> there's a lot going on here. And even if the parents didn't do anything to the kids and something else happened, they're, they're involved and they know, I believe that they know something. Um, but time will tell. Um, but I did search, Julia... And it says that um, there are some adoption assistance, um, like also known as adoption subsidy. Federal and state adoption assistance programs are designed to help adoptive parents meet children's varied and often costly needs. Adoption assistance may provide monthly maintenance payments, medical assistance, and other support, often until the child turns 18 or even 21. So that's a question. Here. Well, and with them with them gone, do they benefit but with insurance in any way, shape, or form? Well, we all know about that, you know, dad would write us off on his taxes. So or not write us off, but <laughs> like there there were special um tax breaks in there for for people who have children. So I, I don't know anything about that because I've never wanted or desired children. Um, but I, I can do some research into that. But like insurance, <clears throat> like would they benefit from their disappearance? I all? don't think so. Other than the fact that, you know, let's just say they were considered special needs adoption cases where, so I don't know all the details as to like, what would qualify the like child life, for that. Like life insurance. Or kind of like with uh, James Alex, where the grandma was uh, taking the checks that, you know, the state was providing. And um, she would have continued to do do so even after he had died if if no one had known anything about it. So, I mean, there are those cases where, you know, let's just keep collecting the check and hope, you know, nobody finds out. But that that's gutsy. That's stupid. That's not even gutsy. That's just stupid. Yeah. Um, especially in this day and age, but okay. Again, this just repeating for everybody's sake, this is a ton of conjecture because again, not a ton of evidence, just, um, 
some vague statements and that don't quite line up and you know right. it's really all we got to go on but it's um it's hard not to come up with theories mm-hmm. when you don't have a lot of information but you kind of have to in order to kind of try to make sense about any of it because it's like uh, what happened to them and then right. um you know there's always that statement where it's usually it's more frequent for something to happen from someone that's close to you Mm -hmm. in the heat of the moment than it is a stranger. Yeah. So it's just, it's so difficult to know. And, um, you know, I believe the grandparents when they say they think that the, they're great parents and that everything's good. I mean, family is something a supportive grandparent should say. Yeah. (laughs) I'm sure our grandparents, oh, yeah, they've always said that about our parents, and we know how that went, but. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Listen, (laughs) also to say, it is historical. Okay, I've been listening to Behind the Bastards podcast. It has nothing to do with kids, really, but he's been doing a series on insurrections and basically fascist insurrections um, all over the world that are very scarily uh, similar to our, um, our the January 6th uh, insurrection that we saw. So mm-hmm. um, he's going through that. And Julie, it's fascinating. You have to listen to it. I mean, it, it is so eerie. But he's, he's basically, he was mentioning um, the, oh, what was it? The... There was in France, there was like a, um, essentially they were, there was a spy and they were trying to figure out who was leaking information to, um, I think it was like Germany specifically. And there wasn't a ton of anti-Semitism in, in France at that time, but it was, it was growing. And, uh, they basically blamed it on this Jew who worked there and uh, they said because he was writing and he was seemed like he was cold that that meant he was guilty and essentially what um he was saying is that okay we're really really bad as humans at reading if someone is guilty or not it's like <clears throat> very rarely have we ever been successful at just looking at someone and knowing if they are truly guilty and and uh, to what extent so yeah that's to preface that Julie and I are, are fatally flawed human and beings. And we're not and expert analysis. <laughs> no, and we will Analyst. most likely be wrong. See, I can't even say it correctly. <laughs> we're not expert <laughs> analysis. Analysts. <laughs> Analysts. See? <laughs> or, or <laughs> like, what's his name in uh, Arrested Development? He's an uh, um, an alropist, and there it looks like it's an anal rapist. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> oh, no no! You don't remember that? It's oh been a while. man! Because it's on his yeah. business card, and it's supposed to be a now rapist, and he, it just looks like. An <laughs> oh no! Oh yeah! <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> that took a bad turn, Julia. I feel like you would you would have a lot in common with um, that character and how. Job? He says, "Gob." No, not Job. <laughs> not Gob. It's a the guy with the mustache. He's maybe his dad. Oh maybe no! His dad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, he's always being misunderstood. And never he's like, naked. I blew myself, and he's just covered in blue. <laughs> never nude. <laughs> the never nude. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> although I think you're. On the opposite side of the spectrum from him. <laughs> what? What is that? <laughs> okay. I don't okay. even know. We digress. Julie, I'm just talking about the way that people misunderstand what he's saying, and he has a special way of putting things that come across <laughs> not well. <laughs> also, myself. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Happy birthday. That one. Yeah. I gave that one to you early. Thank you. You're welcome. So much. We'll wrap this up. We appreciate you guys joining us. Um, and please do comment and um, share anything that you have that we may have missed. And 
um, we appreciate each and every one of you. So please join the family. And um, Jilly, what else do you have to say? What do I have to say? Just be nice, you know. Be a good person. Be, be good people. Be nice. Helpful. Be mindful. Yeah. Helpful. Be mindful of other people's feelings. And um, yeah, that's my takeaway from the week. And let's hope that these parents are truly innocent. Like, I, I want things to turn out well here. But, yeah. you know, anybody who pays attention to anything true crime related, we're, we're a bit of a jaded bunch. And we we, we go through of- rabbit holes at at the expense of innocent people just because of signs <laughs> signs of wanting suspicion. to know answers like we're we yeah. we are fatally flawed in that area too where we just need an answer so if we watch a movie that leaves us open and hanging we get really dissatisfied we are like but we want it tied up with a bow please well so- funny thing it's just maddening when especially maddening when this is current and they are still missing and there's still mm-hmm. a lot of unanswered questions it's like where are they are they okay are they okay mm-hmm. i want to know that they are okay like that yeah. is what drives me insane and then when nothing adds up it's like uh I just, they're, t- they're so tiny. They're babies. So Three also are their babies. The last thing I'm going to say is that I know that it's difficult to be a parent and I have so much uh, ignorance when it comes to all of the things that uh, parents deal with on a daily basis. But at the end of the day, you are responsible for the life that you either bring into the world or you have under your care. And um, that goes for that goes for animals as well. Like we we are responsible for their well being, and typically, if something really heinous happens, um, you you kind of are are gonna be viewed as responsible because you are responsible for that life. So let's also hold them accountable at the same time as allowing them to be innocent until proven guilty. But um, yeah, yeah, guys, have a good rest of your week. Julie and I will see you next time. And once again, thank you and join the family.